tried something new last week. If you get there, if you'd say the word word, as in the word of God, that would let us know you're in the right chapter, in the right verse. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 is where we are today. You can audibly say it. Thank you so much. We hear you. We hear you. Those of you on tablets and phones, you should be quicker than everybody else. Uh, got the old school version of the Bible. Um, might be a little bit slower. And so, hey, um, in most houses, there are two types of dishes, right? So there's a type of dish that you put ketchup on and pizza and corn dogs and hamburgers and hot dogs and whatever you grill, you slap it on there and you just put it on there. And they're what we call the everyday dishes, right? You put them in the dishwasher and you count on them just to be there. Some of them are chipped, some of them are cracked, and we still use them, right? They are everyday dishes. But there's another type of dish that you don't use every day, and they seem to kind of appear on the table for some of us when there's a tall green tree in the living room with lights on it, and they just appear on the dining room table, and you only see them at that time of the year, right? Some of them appear at other times, maybe for special birthdays. Some of them appear when wrapping paper is involved, but when the, when the guests are mocking out, when the wrapping paper is cleaned up and put in the trash can, these dishes don't go in the dishwasher. No, no, no. They go in the sink, right? And they are hand-washed with only the finest of linens from Egypt, right? <laughs> and so uh, this is the kind your mom would be like, if you break that dish, uh, this will not be a happy Christmas for you. And so, uh, and so you, you kind of bring them delicately you don't try to stack them. None of these are chipped. None of these are cracked. And once they are cleaned and dried off, they are not stored in the cabinet with the everyday dishes. No, 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 with the ketchup and the mustard stains on them. These are put in a separate cabinet, sometimes in a separate room, right? Anybody grow up with this? Like there was a box in our living room that only was opened for these occasions, and it had what we would consider, I guess, china or not the everyday dishes, and so they are put in there. You could say that these dishes are set apart, <laughs> that they are different, that they are other, they are distinct, they are cut off from what's considered common. To put it metaphorically, these dishes are holy, <laughs> right? So to say of God that he is holy is to identify his position as a being that is set apart. God is unique. He is different. He is other. He is distinct from everything that exists. Today we're going to look at four verses, okay? For those of you, we've taken some large chunks of Nehemiah, and we're going to look at four verses today. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 through 12, and we're going to talk about the holiness and the joy of the Lord. So if you have a Bible, make sure you're at Nehemiah chapter 8. If you have a teaching sheet, if you don't, please get up and get one while I'm reading these verses. Uh, I would love you to have one to follow along in the sermon. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. If I would have taken a biblical survey this morning, I would, have said, I would have said, what book of the Bible is that phrase, the joy of the Lord is your strength? How many of you would have guessed Nehemiah? How many of you would have guessed Psalms? Okay, okay, some responses. Just blink at me if that would have been you. That would have been me, right? Every time I read this in Nehemiah, I'm like, that's in Nehemiah? 
Just heard that phrase all my life. You see it on the side of coffee cups. Don't get me started. So here we go. Big idea about Nehemiah 8, 9 through 12. I'm not quite sure I've got this one nailed down, so I just want you to know this one's gone through many revisions. So here we go. As Christians, we believe that the Lord is our strength. When we deny this truth with our sinful choices, we need to confess and repent while relying on his joy to be enough to satisfy us. As Christians, we believe that the Lord is our strength. When we deny this truth with our sinful choices, we need to confess and repent while relying on his joy to be enough to satisfy us. One more time. As Christians, we believe that the Lord is our strength. When we deny this truth with our sinful choices, we need to confess and repent while relying on his joy to be enough to satisfy us. As we talked about last week, uh, Ezra 1 through 6 is rebuilding of the temple. Ezra 7 through 10 is rebuilding of the community. Nehemiah 1 through 6, rebuilding of the wall. Nehemiah 7 through 13, the rebuilding of the community. So that's what's happening in these latter parts in Nehemiah. The wall is finished. It was finished in a miraculous 52 days because they worked as unto the Lord. They weren't distracted by all the things. I follow this guy on Instagram named Paul David Tripp, and I've read some of his books. And this is a quote that I read a few years ago that I was brought back to this week, and it says this, You and I must not forget that we live between the already and the not yet, where sin still lives and rescuing grace remains essential. Do you feel that? I do. Every day. I realize that I am a new creation in Christ, but my sinful nature still resides inside of me, and it's a war. It's a battle going on, and we live in the already and the not yet, that we have been made holy, and we are being made holy, and one day we will be glorified, right? Verse 9 of Nehemiah. Today, I think you're going to feel the tension of what we just read in these verses. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, so that's what their jobs are now. Nehemiah is no longer the cupbearer, he's the governor of Judah. And Ezra the priest and scribe, who's been there for years before Nehemiah even arrived on the scene. And the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. As you, if you were here with us last week, or if you're familiar with Nehemiah, so Ezra has just uh, read from the law. And the people are so moved by it. Maybe because they hadn't heard the word in a long time. Maybe because they're just convicted by it. Some people believe that this was the book of Deuteronomy. And as Ezra read it, the people felt it. And they felt conviction. And they wept. And they wept. Look at verse 9. There is freedom in confession and repentance. There is freedom in confession and repentance. For those of you who've been Christians for any length of time, I pray that you have realized that truth. That you don't just confess and repent at the moment of your salvation, but it is a daily practice for the rest of your life. I'd like to put on some kind of weird music right now that really drives this home to you. This is not the kind of church that we have. And so we're just going to put on a soundtrack, and I'm going to keep talking. All right, are we back again? Did I go down too? <laughs> Nothing breaks the moment like some kind of weird uh, we got the DJ back on the stage now, <laughs> mixing it up. Are we good? For those of you who grew up in churches like that, you're like, oh no, I thought this church was not like that. That's why I kept coming here. That is not how we roll. So uh, Lord willing, you will never hear as somebody walk out here and Ethan comes to the piano. So... <laughs> I don't really know how to follow that. Um, 
Can I just tell a quick story? So earlier, I'm sitting on the front row trying to worship Jesus, and Bart is playing the cajon, and he has his shoe untied. And so all in my head, I'm trying to sing the songs and think to myself, how do I tell Bart his shoe's untied? And so then when I came up here to the welcome, I went back to sit down, and guess what? He had tied his shoe. He's playing the cajon and singing and tying his shoe. That's talent right there. All right. Where in the world? Okay, there's freedom in confession and repentance. Uh... If you've been a Christian for any length of time, man, that just really messed me up. This is the same conversation I have with my children about bathing and shampooing their hair, okay? So uh, sometimes your children will come out of the um, bathroom and you'll say to them, did you wash your hair? And they were like, ah, I ran the water through it. And I was like, not the same, right? You need to rinse and repeat on a daily basis would be helpful. Same way with confession and repentance, that you and I are daily confessing and daily repenting. I saw this Instagram post by Priscilla Schreier the other day that, that showed a journal page with just the words, Dear Lord, at the top of it. And all that was on this page was the, were the words, Dear Lord, and then there were just tear stains. And at the caption said, Sometimes this is the best kind of prayer. Have you been there before? You go into th- to pray or to write out your prayer and all that can come is tears. No words could express how you were feeling, just tears, just weeping, and that's where these people have found themselves. As Ezra explained and read the word of God, the assembly's first response was one of conviction and mourning. This is really carries out through all of Scripture. Romans 3.20 says this, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. You see, the law can't save us, but it can reveal to us that we need to be saved and then point us to Jesus the Savior. Paul goes on to say in Romans 7, 7, which is a beautiful chapter about our struggle with sin and living in the already and not yet. Romans 7, 7 says, What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Paul is saying that he knew what sin was because the law told him what sin was. The law says, do not covet. And he therefore said, I am a coveter. God, I have done something that is against your holy law. Paul David Tripp uh, wrote a kind of a prayer of confession. He called it a poem the other day, and it's kind of long. It's going to be about 20 slides long, but I'm going to read it, and I think it's going to get our heart in the right place as we continue through this text, because you and I can't really get this picture of what this was like. Ezra brings out the Word of God, and he starts to read it, and the people start to weep. It's hard sometimes when we're reading scripture just to place ourselves in that position. And I'm not trying to place, this is not a manipulation on your emotions, which was what that organ thing reminds me of, right? Paul David Tripp said this in Forgive Me. Father, forgive me. I am a sinner in desperate need of your grace. Forgive me for the sins I name as less than sinful. Forgive me for hating the sin in others more than my own sin. Forgive me for every moment when I love what you name as evil. Forgive me for loving my pleasure more than I love you. Forgive me for those times when I complain to you more than praise you. Forgive me for those times when my talk is not shaped by a love for you and others. Forgive me for those moments when I fail to give others the grace you've given me. Forgive me for those times I won't control rather than resting in your control. Forgive me for when I doubt your wisdom, mercy, and love. Forgive me for every moment when I am angry because I did not get my own way. 
Forgive me for those times I failed a witness to your rescuing grace. Forgive me for often loving earthly treasures more than the spiritual treasures you have lavished on me. Forgive me for those many moments when I have failed to love my spouse as you love your church. Forgive me for those times when I have used my gifts for my glory and not yours. Forgive me when my fantasies are outside your boundaries. Forgive me when I have responded to the weaknesses of others with irritation and not grace. Forgive me when I am comfortable with a dichotomy between what I profess and how I live. Forgive me when I allow the distractions of earth to keep me from seeking the things above. Forgive me when I am not a good steward of my time, energy, and resources. Forgive me for every time I battle for my way instead of joyfully submitting to your way. Forgive me for every moment I fail to seek and celebrate your generous forgiveness. Forgive me for failing to quest to be holy as you are holy. Forgive me for every instance where my heart wanders from your righteous path. Forgive me for words unsaid that should have been said and for words said that should never have been said. Forgive me for feeling entitled to be loved while at the same time failing to love. Forgive me for carrying a burden of guilt because I have doubted your forgiveness. Forgive me for those times when I have failed to love justice, mercy, and humility. So, I bow before your holiness, not because of my righteousness, but because of the perfect righteousness of the Son. Knowing that my penalty has been paid, I come to you for what only you can offer. Please work to keep my heart tender and may my mouth always be willing to confess my need for your forgiveness. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just need to read someone else's prayer of confession to help me in my confession. As we went through those, I'm sure some of those hit harder than others, right? All of us in this room are probably different on our scale of where those kind of land in our hearts. But we need to be reminded that there is freedom in confession and repentance. And the best thing you and I could do is to bring our sin to the light. So after you've understood God's word and wept, you have to dry your eyes and remember that God is good. There's a song we sing called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And there is a part of the song that's just kind of captured my heart for the past few months. And it says this, What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. I don't know about you. Sometimes I have a troubled soul. When I read a prayer of confession like that, yes, I just confess, and yes, I repent, but I want to remember that what calms my troubled soul is that God is good, that God is good, that He is holy. The song goes on to say, What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls belong to him belong, that our souls to him belong. So how do we know that our souls belong to God? We put all the faith we have in all that Jesus is. Some of us have this misunderstanding that we need to have this like Nehemiah type of faith where if God called us to go and build a wall somewhere, that we would just jump on that, on that train, right? Some of you compare yourselves to Nehemiah and you go, I'd never have that kind of faith. Hey, let me free you up something today. God is the giver of faith. So you and I need to place whatever size faith we have in all that Jesus is. God hasn't called you to be someone else. He's actually created you to be you. And the quicker you and I 
can embrace the fact, yes, I think our faith grows. Yes, I hope my faith has grown since my early childhood confession until now. But you and I can get lost in the fact that it is about us. And we can so easily get distracted from the, fa- from the fact that it is about Him. He is big enough. He is the one that you and I can count on. You put all of the faith that you have in all that Jesus is. According to the Jewish calendar... At this time, the Jews had just observed the annual Day of Atonement. The Lord had dealt with their sins, according to Leviticus 16, so they should have been rejoicing in His forgiveness. You see, this time of year, the Feast of Tabernacles follows the Day of Atonement, giving God's people an entire week of happy celebration. So there is conviction, then there is cleansing, and then there is celebration. The word of God can lead us to celebration. Jeremiah 15, 16 says it like this. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. That the word of God can be a delight to our heart. Psalm 19, 8. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So yes, there is a time for confession and repentance. And then there is a time for celebration. There are freedom and joy in repentance. There are freedom and joy in repentance. You see, God wasn't punishing Adam and Eve by the one tree ban in the Garden of Eden. He was actually giving them all the other trees to eat from. But just like us, we tend to focus on the one tree, right? He knew that they needed to remember that He is God and that they were made in His image, not the other way around. Let me try to tie these things in together for us with the rest of the Bible. In John chapter 15, Jesus teaches about being the vine and that believers are the branches. So we have life only when we are connected to the source of life. That is Jesus, right? John 15 says this. Jesus is teaching and he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This is the part we need to understand Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So we abide in him, for apart from him, we can do nothing. Everybody got it? We have to be attached to the vine. John 15, 9 through 11 A few verses later says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So Jesus' joy in you. When you and I obey God, even in our confession and repentance, Jesus is saying that his joy is in us and that our joy is full. Who wants to live a life like that? Full of Jesus' amount of joy, not your amount of joy. Paul is going to say something in Philippians 3, 13 through 14 that goes along with this. He says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, 
I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let me just kind of ask you guys a heart question here. How many of you, that's not the question, okay. How are you at forgetting what lies behind? How are you? How are you at forgetting what you've done in the past? Since I've been here um, as the as your pastor at Cross Point, uh, one of the things we've asked our new members to do in the membership process is to write out their testimony. And so when they write out their testimony, I've challenged them to talk about before Christ and then how Jesus saved them and then what he is doing in their life right now. And, and through some of our conversations, even um, some people, a lot of people actually, have a hard time forgetting what lies behind. So how are you at forgetting what lies behind? And the second part to that same thing is, how are you at straining forward to what lies ahead? You know that when you run a race, if you've ever been a runner, I was a runner at one point in my life, um, what my coaches would always tell me is to keep your eye on the finish line. Because if you start to look behind you and see who's running the race close to you or right behind you, you could veer out of your lane. And for some races, when you veer out of your lane, what happens? You're disqualified. I noticed this in particular at the Little League Park this, this year. One of my sons played baseball. And so we're there and these little leaguers are up there and they would hit the ball and they would have a pretty decent hit. You know, For a little leaguer to hit, even in coach pitch, pretty remarkable, right? So they would hit the ball, and then they would take off towards first. But what I would notice, especially towards the beginning of the season, is that they were watching the ball while they were running, right? And they would keep their eye on that ball. But what I noticed that when they would keep their eye on that ball and not on the first base is that oftentimes they were thrown out even by inches. But as the season progressed, what I noticed is that they would hit the ball and then they would just take off like their pants were on fire towards first. <laughs> and then a lot of times they could make their way because what you have to know about little leaguers that maybe little leaguers don't comprehend themselves is that they're not that accurate with the ball. <laughs> That's why the coach is pitching. Everybody with me? Really, in, real, in reality, if you and I were standing there and the coach was pitching, I mean, we'd be cranking it, right? <laughs> But they don't comprehend that the coach is pitching because everybody else on the field not that accurate with the ball. And so if they would just take off towards first and not worry about the ball and worry about getting to first, they would have a lot more of a success rate, right? Same way in the Christian life. Yes, you should remember what God has done in your past and how he has captured your heart. But brothers and sisters, we have got to strain forward to what he has called us to. And that is a pursuit of holiness. We can weep and mourn over our sin. We can confess them to the Lord. But then we need to strain forward to what lies ahead. We should pursue holiness. We should run after Jesus. Sprint to him with all the power of the Holy Spirit. My pastor in Texas he discipled a bunch of us guys. We were young Christian. I mean, we were young guys. Uh, we were Christians. Um, and so he was discipling us. And he would say this all the time. He would say, he'd say, fellas. That's how he would say it. He would say, fellas. Got that Texas good voice. He would say, you want to run after Jesus as fast as you can. And he said, if you want a spouse, if you desire a spouse, you look to the left and the right of you and see who is running after Jesus as fast as you. He said, brothers, don't look behind you. He said, you keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And every once in a while, you glance to the left and right and you go, who's running the race after Jesus as hard as you are? You don't want to look behind you. You don't want to slow down. 
Verse 10. It's just a word for the singles in the house. It can be, it can be hard. But I, I would commend you, encourage you to run after Jesus. Pursue him. Verse 10. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing already. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Again, they're telling the people of God not to grieve any longer because verse 10, a renewed relationship with the Lord brings joy after repentance. So you and I can have a renewed relationship with the Lord and it brings joy after repentance. I'm going to read some verses out of Deuteronomy that kind of talk about the Feast of Booths. So it may seem out of context, but they're about to celebrate the Feast of Booths. So Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 15 says this, You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days. When you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and from your wine press, you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose. Because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. Altogether joyful. He's telling them how to approach the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. Listen to what the ESV Study Bible says about this. The Feast of Booths or Tabernacles is called the Feast of Ingathering in Exodus 23 and Exodus 34. It occurs in September and October and it focuses on the harvest of summer fruits such as dates, grapes, and olives. This is the feast in which the law was to be read every seventh year. So verse 13 of Deuteronomy chapter 16, the people have gathered in their produce. They are rejoicing. They are rejoicing in their dependence upon the Lord. They are rejoicing because they know that he is their provider. And the Bible says it so that you will be altogether joyful. He's telling them how to celebrate the Feast of Booths. It's a celebration. Look at Deuteronomy 28, verses 46 through 48. Later on in Deuteronomy, it says, They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things. Therefore, You shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. You see, these people in the nation of Israel should have remembered that right there. They should have remembered that that they were judged because they put their faith in the abundance of all things. Does that sound familiar? Know anybody like that? You and I cannot serve the Lord our God with joyfulness and gladness of heart when really we're counting on things to bring the joy. I really don't like hopping around the Bible, but I thought it was important that you and I see this because it brings something home to us. When the joy of the Lord is your strength, you will know that he is enough. When the joy of the Lord is your strength, you will know that he is enough. I've been slowly reading this book. Shelley's already finished it, and so I need to pick it back up. It's a book by Jackie Hill Perry. It's called Holier Than Thou. And in this book, she says, if God is holy, then he can't sin. If God can't sin, then he can't sin against me. If he can't sin against me, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being there is? Let me read it one more time for us. If God is holy, then he can't sin. If God can't sin, then he can't sin against me. And if he can't sin against me, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being there is? Do you know anyone who cannot sin against you? Only God. Right? You and I 
have to understand that God is holy and He is the most trustworthy being there is. He is the most trustworthy being in your life. He is holy, honest, good, just, right, perfect. He can't sin against you so you can trust Him. Does that blow your mind? It should because when you and I think about anyone else, we have to know that there is a possibility that they could sin against us. And God sees you and he knows you. And he's still trustworthy. Verse 10 says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord. How much joy does the Lord have? Did you learn this in grade school? How much wood could a woodchuck wood if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Right? I practice that at home. Okay? That's about how much joy I think the Lord has. <laughs> how much wood could a woodchuck wood? Right? I have no idea. What I know about the joy of the Lord is that it is unending. Shelly and I were newly married. We'd had a one-bedroom apartment. You could stand in the, in the closet, the walk-in closet, and um, it was the only closet we had, and you could see every room of the house through the bathroom mirror. Okay, I could look backwards and see the bedroom, and I could, look in the bathroom, I could look in the bathroom mirror, and I could see the kitchen and the den. That's how small the apartment was. Okay, So Shelly was gone somewhere, and I thought to myself, I'm going to do the dishes. So I grabbed this Joy dishwashing liquid, and I put it in the dishwasher, and I shut the dishwasher, and I walked away. Okay? I may have gone to watch TV. I may have gone to play video games. Let's just be honest. It was a different stage of life. We had no children. I'm the only one in the apartment. I'm responsible. I can do the dishes. So I put this Joy dishwashing liquid in there, and I walk away. Uh, about 30 minutes later, 45 minutes later, I come back in the kitchen to get something to drink, and I'm like, something is wrong with the dishwasher, right? What I learned in that moment is there was an abundance of bubbles flowing from the dishwasher like Mount Vesuvius, okay? Or any kind of volcano you can picture. There were just bubbles of bubbles and bu own bubbles. And they had made their way onto the floor, and they were progressing across our luscious kitchen, okay? Second floor apartment. And so I thought to myself, there must be something wrong with the dishwasher. Duh. There was something wrong with the dishwasher operator, okay? Okay. This had never happened to Shelly, and so I don't even think I had a cell phone. I'm just sitting there going, what is happening? And so what I realize is that dishwashing liquid and dishwashing detergent, not the same thing. And so one time I gave this illustration in another sermon in my hometown, and these mature adults came up to me at the end and they were like you know how to take care of that and so they gave me every solution to this problem to which I graciously said thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much as though they were thinking I was going to do this again okay that's how much they trusted me but but when I think about that moment in my life that was a great learning experience I think about the joy of the Lord and how unending it is. And how if we would just put our faith in Him, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. Come back to that statement where Nehemiah says, Do not be grieved. Then he offered them something in sorrow's place, the joy of the Lord. You and I need something in sorrow's place. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. What I have learned to be true is what you focus on governs how you feel. If you and I only focus on our circumstances, on things, on things that are fleeting, on the, the, uh, the, the like or dislike from other people, then that will govern how we feel. The reason why many of us have stayed grieved for so long is because we stay focused on what is so wrong. Rather than finding our joy in the Lord, we turn on the TV to escape and numb ourselves. We look at social media only to find that it has sapped our joy. 
We enter into illegitimate relationships to escape. We look at pornography to calm our troubled soul. We get involved with drugs and alcohol to escape. But if your focus is proper, properly situated on the Lord, however, He will give you His joy and His joy will give you strength. Because this is what I know about sin. The longer you stare at the sin and the longer you focus on the sin, the more appealing the sin will become. But until, brothers and sisters, you and I can love Jesus and focus on Him and count on Him more than that sin to provide us the joy that we need, we will continue to run back and escape in that sin over and over again. How do I know this? Because I have talked with thousands of people about this constant going back to these things that they thought would bring them everlasting joy, only to find that they left them just as hungry and discouraged as when they found it. And I also know it because it's me. My heart's tendency is prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Long, I'm prone to leave the God I love. How holy is the Lord? He is holy, holy, holy. Some of you have sang these very words. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3 is where we get that beautiful hymn. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And if you go on to read, you'll see Isaiah's response to the fact that he was like, God, you are holy. You and I have a tendency to want to diminish God's holiness, to make him more like us. He is not like us. He is holy and separate from sin, and therefore he is perfect in everything he does. So look at verse 11 and 12. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. They're saying this over and over all throughout these verses. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Listen to what Tony Evans said about verses 11 and 12. The Levites said, Don't grieve. Why? Because that day was holy. In other words, the people were to remember that God was still on his throne and he was still in control. The people had a great celebration because they had understood the words and were explained to them. No party compares to the joy of understanding the gracious word of God that promises salvation and kingdom blessings to all who will believe. So does the Bible make you want to celebrate? It should. There should be times where you read the Bible and God's promises and faithfulness are on full display. And so you want to take it and share it with someone else. <laughs> but you say to one of your friends or your coworkers, and you go, I just got to show you this. I know this may be a little crazy, but I got to show you this part that made me want to celebrate this morning. You know that song, celebrate good times. Come on, right? That was all the vocal harmony I'll give you today. But you and I can read the Bible and celebrate. You can see things that you have never seen before when you read passages that you've read a thousand times. It's like the Holy Spirit just takes that spotlight and says, I want to show you a little bit deeper. One of our students years ago said that the Bible is like a mine of gold. It's full of gold. There's no pebbles in it. It's all gold. So you and I, when we read it, should go, God, I could have never written that. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 7. Sorry for the many verses today. You can look at them later. Wish we had time to unpack them all. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 7. Just kind of wanted to show you all throughout the Bible is this theme of God's holiness and his joy. 
1 Thessalonians 1, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. As Christians, we have the joy of the Holy Spirit, and His joy does not depend on our circumstances, on how we feel. And when we abide in that joy, we will be a light to those around us. He's saying, Paul is saying to these believers in Thessalonica, you were dwelling in the Lord, letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and therefore you were a light to all these places. Now let me take some application for this. I'm just going to walk back through the main points of the sermon. Let me read the big idea one more time. As Christians, we believe that the Lord is our strength. When we deny this truth with our sinful choices, we need to confess and repent while relying on His joy to be enough to satisfy us. The first one is, there is freedom in confession and repentance. Here's just a heart question. When is the last time you had an honest conversation with God about how you are doing spiritually? When's the last time you just set aside some time and just said, God, I need you, I need you to know that I see where I am at spiritually? Number two, what truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. How can you remind yourself of God's goodness this week? Do you need to write that on a sticky note, put it on your computer at work, put it on your window where you wash the dishes, put it on your window, your mirror, sorry, your window, don't get ready in the front of the, the window, on your mirror in your bathroom. Some of you need to look at that before you walk out of the door on, on the mornings and you could just go, what truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. Some of you need to put it in your car, your truck, where you can see it every single day. Don't put it over the speedometer. Okay. God is good, but we can drive crazy, right? Number three, that was not a license to drive crazy. Moving on, number three, what is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls belong to him? So we put our faith in all that Jesus is. My simple question to you today would be, have you put all the faith that you have in all that Jesus is? Friend, if you've walked in here today and you just found yourself meditating and thinking about the holiness of God and you thought to yourself, I've never seen or heard or known of anyone like that. My question to you today would be, have you ever put all the faith that you have in all that Jesus is? And through no magic prayer, but through an honest one, just said, Jesus, I need you to save me because I am a sinner. Jesus, I need you to give me a new heart because this one is full of sin. Jesus, I confess that I've been trying to run my own life and it's obvious that that's not going well. I need you to take utter and full control of my life. I give my life to you. Next, there are freedom and joy and obedience. Hey, if, if that last thing, if you're just like, hey, I, I think I'd like to know more about that. I'd love to see you after the service. I just want to slow down for a second and just allow the Holy Spirit, you know, to, to make his way in our hearts. He doesn't need my permission, by the way. He definitely doesn't need an organ. <laughs> he, he can move. He can move when he wants to move. There are freedom and joy and obedience. Christians, I hope you found this to be true, that there is joy and obedience, and we need, to, we need to concentrate on living a holy and pure life. When the joy of the Lord is your strength, you will know that he is enough. 
It's bringing us back to that statement by Jackie Hill Perry. If God is holy, then he can't sin. And if he can't sin, then he can't sin against me. If he can't sin against me, then he is the most trustworthy being there is. And he is enough. What you focus on governs how you feel. What have you been focused on lately? Is there something you're running to to numb yourself other than Jesus? And the last one is just a question we've been asking for a couple of weeks. What could God do in you and through you in the next 52 days if you set your gaze on him and ran to him as fast as you could? We started a few weeks ago, June 5th to July 26th. Brothers and sisters, there, there's no better time to renew your relationship with Jesus than now. If you're waiting to pursue holiness when you get to be older, that's just a, that's a bad life strategy. The time is now to realize that God is holy and he is worth everything that we could ever give him. I pray that we in this room could come alongside of each other and cheer each other on towards holiness. My prayer as your pastor is that that would be the kind of faith family that we are. That his holiness would be on our minds. That each other's good would be in our prayers. That God would stir in us a hunger and thirst for him and his word and for the fellowship of other believers. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you are holy and good and right and just. And I thank you that you will never, ever sin against us. How remarkable is that? That is a wondrous mystery, God, that we sing of and we meditate on today. Christ in us, the hope of glory, is just is a truth that we could never fully comprehend this side of heaven. Father, I pray that we would dwell on your holiness and your joy. And that those things would take root in our hearts and we would abide in you and that you would abide in us. Father, may we pursue holiness alongside of each other. May we cheer each other on toward holiness, towards humility, towards mercy, towards what is right. Father, we thank you that, Jesus, you are the way and the truth and the life. May we bank everything that we have on you. And may we find joy in this kind of obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.